year when I gave my talk, the Federal Reserve had raised interest rates in December of 2018. And pretty much everybody believed, at least everybody whose opinion counts, that the Fed was going to raise rates another three times in 2019. Well, they got the number right, right? The Fed did move interest rates three times, except the direction was the opposite of what everybody thought. Instead of hiking interest rates three times, the Fed cut interest rates three times. Now, of course, all the people who were completely surprised by exactly what I said was going to happen, right, they act as if something must have changed. That, well, the Fed was going to raise interest rates three times. They were going to normalize rates, but then they just didn't. That somehow circumstances changed that they necessarily couldn't foresee, and so they had to uh, do this about face. But none of that is true. Nothing changed. The only thing that changed, if you want to call it a change, is that the market started to react to the prior rate hikes precisely the way anybody should have been able to figure was going to happen. The Fed pricked its own bubble by raising interest rates the first time. It just took a while before the air really started to come out in a way that made everybody scared. Because remember, in December, we had the worst December in the U.S. stock market since the Great Depression. And had the Fed not reversed course, had the Fed continued on its trajectory, we probably would have already had a worse market decline than the one we had in 2008. We would probably already be in a greater recession than the one that we had in 2008. But the Federal Reserve did not cancel that recession or market crash. It simply postponed it by reverting to this very policies that inflated the bubble in the first place. Now, it never made any sense to me that you had so many people that just believed that the Fed could normalize interest rates. How anybody could feel that normal rates were possible when you have an abnormally large amount of debt. And I knew that this journey was impossible to complete before the Fed even embarked on it. Before the Fed raised interest rates for the first time in December 2015, I spent the entire year saying they wouldn't raise rates. And the reason I said they wouldn't is because I said they were smart enough to know if they ever attempted to normalize rates, they could never complete the process. And I thought that revelation would be more problematic for the Fed than just never trying to do it at all and proving that I was correct. And of course, when 2014 came to an end, much like when 2018 came to an end, everybody believed the Fed would raise rates three or four times in 2015, except for me. And the Fed waited until the last possible minute. They didn't raise rates until December of that year. That wasn't an accident. The Fed didn't want to raise rates. It just didn't want to admit that. It wanted to pretend that it could raise rates without actually proving that it couldn't by raising them. But it had backed itself into such a big corner that it kind of felt pressured to do something. And so they raised rates. And my initial reaction was, OK, it's one and done, right? The Fed is not going to raise rates anymore. And I believe that forecast would have been accurate, but for the election of Donald Trump. I think had Hillary Clinton won, the Fed never would have raised rates a second time. We would have gone back to zero already, and the Fed would have restarted QE sooner than it did. But because Donald Trump was elected, that provided the Fed some cover, because it created a lot of false optimism for the markets, right? That Trump was going to somehow make America great again. He was going to slash regulation. He was going to cut government spending or cut taxes and pay off the national debt and all sorts of you know, promises and things that people attributed uh, to Trump uh, created a, a lot of enthusiasm, especially among Republicans and, of course, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of small business owners. They tend to be Republican, so they became more optimistic about the economy. And so that created another boost. Uh, and, of course, the tax cuts themselves provided another shot of Keynesian 
fiscal stimulus late in this, uh, in this cycle because we had tax cuts, but we actually also had spending increases. A lot of people overlooked the fact that government spending increased dramatically uh, since Trump was elected, not just on the military, which Trump brags about all the time, how much money we borrowed uh, to buy more military equipment, but we also borrowed a lot of money to provide for more social spending. So we had this huge increase in deficit spending you know, that temporarily skewed the GDP numbers to get people to think that the economy was actually doing better since Trump was elected than before he took office, when the reality is we're simply continuing the same failed policies that Obama had, who's continuing the same failed policies uh, that Bush had. I mean, you know, if you look at the popularity of President Trump right now with Republicans, he's extremely popular uh, among Republicans, even though the only real difference between Trump and any other Republican president, or even Democratic president for that matter, because he's a very liberal uh, Republican, it's all, it's all style. It's not substance. His style is different. His delivery is different. But if you look at what's actually happening, it's just massive government spending, massive, massive deficit spending. And so the big, fat, ugly bubble that he inherited from uh, Obama is simply bigger and fatter and uglier than when he took office. But people are not paying attention to that, to the problem. And, you know, now that the Fed has done precisely what I said it would do, and in fact, you know, the, my, one of my, well, was my last appearance, but I was on Fox Business on uh, two days before the Fed's last, last rate hike. And during that appearance, I was asked, you know, what the Fed was going to do, and I said, well, they're probably going to raise rates, but I think this is the last hike. I think after this December rate hike, the next thing the Fed is going to do is cut rates, and that's exactly what they did. But I also made another prediction on that interview. I said that after the Fed cut rates, they would go back to quantitative easing. Of course, nobody expected the Fed to do that because the Fed was talking about quantitative tightening. It was supposed to be on autopilot. It was supposed to be like watching paint dry. And that prediction has also come true. The Federal Reserve is back to quantitative easing. Now, the Federal Reserve doesn't want to admit this because they specifically have stated over and over again, in fact, every chance they get, they say we're not doing QE, except that's exactly what they are doing. See, they've created a distinction without a difference. See, when they were officially doing QE, the Fed was concentrating its debt monetization on longer-term government bonds. Now it's concentrating its debt monetization on short-term government bonds. What's the difference? They're still monetizing government debt. The balance sheet is actually growing faster now, when they, now that they're not doing QE than it was when they were doing QE. So this is the biggest QE they've ever done. Of course, it's open-ended. It's never going to stop. And the fact that they are monetizing a lot of short-term debt, which, of course, there's a lot more short-term debt out there to be monetized than there is long-term debt. That's part of the problem, the way we finance the national debt. But because they're so active at the short end, that just means they're going to have to step up the amount that they're monetizing more frequently because everything they monetize is going to have to be remonetized when it matures. And the reason the Fed is back to quantitative easing, the reason the Fed is cutting interest rates, right, is because they helped create an economy that was completely addicted to cheap money. We have much more debt now than we did before the Fed first started QE. We have much more debt now than when we had a debt crisis, and that caused the Fed to slash interest rates, but instead of allowing the debt to be liquidated in the crisis, we have even more debt than we've ever had before. You know, I'm even starting to read a lot of articles in the mainstream media about how the Fed kind of has no choice now, right? How the Fed is kind of in a position, and not just the Fed, but other central banks, where they have to keep the monetary spigots open indefinitely, right? Where uh, the Fed has to go back to zero or stay near zero, wherever it is, that they're going to have to continue to do quantitative easing forever. 
And this is not something that people should just be discovering. This was obvious from day one. But what all the, you know, the, the writers are getting wrong when they talk about that now the Fed has no choice is first of all, they do have a choice. Right? It's just that there's no pain-free choice. See, the Fed can do the right thing and then we have to deal with the pain now or they can keep doing the wrong thing so we have to deal with even more pain in the future. See, that's the problem. It's politically they don't have a choice because when it comes to politics, nobody wants pain now. They'd rather postpone it to somebody else's watch. Now, of course, the central bankers are supposed to be independent. They're not supposed to care if politicians feel some pain, if they're held accountable for their extravagance by the voters. But this should really set aside any kind of illusions that any central banks anywhere in the world are politically independent. Because the only reason they're pursuing this reckless policy is because of politics. You know, I thought it was funny when Donald Trump uh, uh, gave his uh, signing speech when he, when he put his John Hancock on a completely meaningless uh, phase one China trade deal. And during this, his acceptance speech, he went off on a tangent where he started talking about negative interest rates and how great it was and how lucky the Europeans were that they can go out and borrow money at negative rates. And, you know, us dumb Americans, we actually have to pay to borrow. And, and he thought that this was a great thing. And he really lamented the fact that we don't have negative interest rates yet in the United States. And he really wants them. But then he kind of posed this rhetorical question. He said, but I always wondered who's dumb enough to buy these bonds. I mean, I understand, you know, borrowing at negative rates, but lending? I mean, who's dumb enough to lend money at a negative rate? Well, the answer to Trump's question is the ECB, is the Bank of Japan. It's central banks that are dumb enough to buy negative yielding bonds, and Donald Trump wants the Fed to be as dumb as all the other central banks. Now, he's probably going to get his wish, but the reality is why are central banks doing stuff that is so dumb, they're doing it for politics. It's smart politics to postpone the pain, but it's lousy economics, it's lousy monetary policy. But one of the things too that people just don't get is how bad this crisis is gonna be now. Because the Fed can't do this indefinitely. The foreign central banks can't do this indefinitely. Sure, they can buy bonds all they want. They can create dollars out of thin air and buy up bonds to pretend, prevent interest rates from rising. But what they can't prevent is the dollar from collapsing. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And a currency crisis is going to make the financial crisis look like a Sunday school picnic. Now, the reason the dollar didn't collapse when they did QE1 and QE2, and the reason the price of gold stopped going up when it hit 1900 and it pulled back down to 1000 the reason all of that happened is because everybody believed that the Fed could end that they could normalize interest rates, that they could shrink their balance sheet. After all, that's what the Fed was saying. And so everybody believed what the Fed was saying instead of actually thinking about how ridiculous what they were saying actually was, how what they were saying was impossible. But people didn't care, right? Because everybody just followed the herd and bought the dollar and sold gold and bought into the stock market and the bond market based on this ridiculous belief that the Fed could do something that was impossible. Well, now the world should know that it's impossible. And I think they are gradually coming to that conclusion, except they haven't come to the ultimate conclusion as to what it all means. Right now they're thinking, okay, yes, the Fed is gonna do this forever. They're never gonna return interest rates to normal. They're never going to shrink their balance sheet, but they think that's okay. It is not okay because it was the anticipation of the normalization process, of all the rate hikes, of all the quantitative tightening. That's what kept the dollar from collapsing. That's what made it go up. Once the dollar starts to fall on the acceptance of the fact that rates are never going to normalize, that's when you have a crisis because inflation is going to rear its head in a very, very ugly way. In fact, we already have the major uh, indexes that the government looks at, right, we're about 2% or a little higher. 
And the government says, that's not enough. We need more. We need to have symmetry. We need higher inflation. But at some point, as the inflation rate really takes off and they can no longer mask it uh, behind the phony numbers, there's going to be a crisis. There's going to be a sovereign debt crisis. It's not just going to be the Federal Reserve buying bonds. They're going to be the only ones dumb enough to buy those bonds. Because when you have a higher rate of inflation, it's not just negative nominal yields, but negative real yields. When Donald Trump said, who's dumb enough to buy negative nominal yields? Well, who's dumb enough to buy negative real yields? Because real yields being negative still means you're losing money. And at the end, there's only going to be one buyer that dumb, and that's going to be the Fed. And so we're going to have this dollar crisis. Gold is going to take off. And I think probably the most dangerous part about all of this is the political ramifications. Because nobody is really focusing on this story. And I pointed it out, too. Even when Donald Trump won and I was giving talks, what I said at the time was that the real story was not that Trump won. He, he won on a populist message. The reason that, or what was so significant about the 2016 election is that Bernie Sanders almost beat Hillary Clinton. To me, that was far more significant than Donald Trump winning, because I thought that there was a pretty good chance that Trump could win. And I think that had the Democrats not rigged the primaries, Sanders would have won. And he may win this time. I mean, they're trying their best to prevent them from winning, but we'll see what happens. But there has been a huge shift in the political spectrum in the United States. Because Donald Trump is a very liberal Republican. He's probably the biggest spender, the most liberal Republican we've had in office, maybe since Nixon. Right? He's a Rockefeller Republican. He's the opposite of what um, um, Reagan was supposed to be. Um, but what's so surprising about this massive shift is that the Republicans love it. As I said, Trump is extremely popular with the Tea Party Republicans. Remember, the Tea Party was founded as a protest to the big deficits that Obama was running during the Great Recession. Well, Trump is running even bigger deficits when we're supposedly having the greatest economy in the history of the country. Yet no one in the Tea Party who was upset about those big deficits, when at least you can make the false argument that we needed them, right? Nobody is worried about Trump running even bigger deficits when nobody can claim that we need them. And the problem is, if the deficits are this big now, when times are supposedly good, what does that mean during the next recession? Because it's not like we're never going to have one. How much bigger are those deficits going to be? And there is going to be no push on the Republican side to be able to counteract those deficits like the Tea Party did when Obama was president. The deficits would have been much bigger under Obama had the Republicans not been pushing back. Well, those Republicans aren't going to be able to push back even if they want to. They look like complete hypocrites if they did. So you have the Republican Party that for all practical purposes is now the Democratic Party. They're the party of protectionism, uh, big government spending, big deficits. Sure, they want tax cuts, but they don't want to make government smaller. They just want to pay for bigger government with debt and inflation. Those aren't conservative principles. So you have the Republicans that are now the Democrats. And where are the Democrats? The Democrats are the socialists. Those are the only two parties we have left in America. We have a Democratic Party and we have the Socialist Party, uh, you know, led by Bernie Sanders or Warren or AOC and that's the wing of the, the Democratic Party that is gaining popularity. And the problem is the Republicans have so invested themselves in this fake narrative of how great this economy is and claiming credit. Trump was elected because he told the truth about how bad the economy was. Now he's lying and pretending that the same bad economy is great. And when it blows up, this is going to play right into the hands of the left. And the United States is going to make a sharp turn left, probably bigger than we've ever done since FDR. Uh, and it's happening at a time when we're already broke. And the idea is it doesn't matter because we could pay for it all with the magic of the printing press. Doesn't matter how many bonds the US government sells, doesn't matter how much money we print, because it's all good, right? Nothing bad could happen. So this is going to be a perfect storm, an economic, financial, political storm. There is going to be no reprieve 
like we had last time where the Federal Reserve was able to bail everybody out because this crisis is not just a subprime mortgage crisis, it's a sovereign debt crisis, it is a dollar crisis. So you're gonna have to bail yourself out. You're gonna have to make the right investments now because if you don't make them now, there's no other way to, to get your purchasing power back. And I see that uh, I'm out of time here. I'm gonna talk about uh, what we should be doing with our money and how to protect uh, our, our savings and profit uh, from what's going to be happening over the next several years at my workshop later today. I think it's at one o'clock, so I'll see everybody there. Thank you. <laughs>